Thank you for the kind, uh, kind introduction, Betsy. Uh, just one modest correction, which is I have two appointments at Vanderbilt. One is over in Peabody as a professor of public policy and education. My main appointment is right upstairs here in the Department of Political Science. Maybe some of my colleagues would have been glad to have gotten rid of me, but I'm sorry, I've got to disappoint them. Um, I want to thank you for being here today, and um, it's always a pleasure to uh, talk to people for, to whom I don't have to explain who Barry Goldwater was, and they, <laughs> or who Ronald Reagan was. Uh, it becomes more and more difficult. I have to uh, keep updating my lecture material, even, you know, those yellow notes, you can't use them all the time in political science. Maybe you can if you use teaching calculus, but we can't get away with that quite as much. Uh, I want to talk about congressional elections today. Um, I'm almost at the point of ignoring the presidential election, so I'd like you to amuse me for an hour and, and uh, you know, because we know all the scandal, corruption, vice involved in the presidential election. And by talking about Congress, we can free ourselves from those, <laughs> from those concerns totally. Um, you'll have to forgive me. I, I, view, um, I view the presidential election sort of as World War I, which is both sides are heavily armed. There's a line of battle. They're shooting everything back and forth. The media is covering all the events and the line of battle just doesn't move very much. Or if it moves, it moves back again. So my sense is, if you really want to have fun studying elections and campaigns, where the campaign really makes a difference, you really want to study congressional elections, not presidential elections. Although, as we know, there's hardly any attention given to the congressional elections. And so I'm going to hopefully correct that a little bit and give you more attention than you'd like to have. Um, in this talk. I will warn you one thing, and, and I'm going to try to make as much time available for questions here, but um, long ago when I was in graduate school, a group of us got together and decided, after watching some of our professors, and I won't go into detail about it, that academics tend to take on the attributes of whatever they study. Uh, and if you and if you've written books on the Senate, then uh, there is a tendency to filibuster. Uh, but I will try to uh, uh, not go over uh, your tolerance and to let you get involved. If at any point you have a question during the talk, just raise your hand and I'll try to get to it. If you're like some of my students, they actually anticipate where I'm going, um, and uh, that's always fun. Uh, it shows that I'm maybe doing a halfway decent job. Well, so the title of this talk, is investigating the 2016 congressional elections. A political scientist assumes the persona of Lieutenant Colombo. And you're of the age group that I can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that you know who Lieutenant Colombo is. And, and the, uh, the, the great thing is uh, I, I've got mysteries here, but they're. Uh, they're uh, not your typical mysteries in that, uh, as yet, there are no murders involved uh, to solve. But I want to uh, make sense out of House and Senate elections in 2016. And I don't like a lot of the conventional explanations for how we try to understand them. As I said, presidential elections, and we'll forgive all my colleagues who study them, and you'll have more of them in here, Presidential elections are relatively easy to understand and generally highly predictable. Um, but there are lots of loose ends to tie up, even in studying those. And as you'll see in studying congressional elections and in talking to you, my favorite line in this talk will be, but just one more thing. <laughs> so I'm going to be hopefully not quite as annoying as Peter Falk was to his victims. Uh, but uh, get to a few of the questions. And there, there are three questions I'd like to address today. First, can we apply the same analysis for understanding House and Senate elections? And if not, why not? Why are House and Senate elections different types of elections? And why do you want to focus on different things if you want to understand them? Second. How good are the current indicators of predicting the outcomes of House and Senate elections? 
both in terms of who will win individual House and Senate races, and basically in terms of the overall seat gain. Which party is going to gain in, these, in the 2016 elections? House seats, which party is going to gain Senate seats, and how should we interpret a gain or loss of those seats? It's not quite as easy as it appears, and our indicators, again, are somewhat different for House and Senate election. And finally, since we can't avoid talking about the presidential election totally, what effect will the presidential election have on the outcomes? Will there be presidential coattails or something which people will label as coattails even if it's not, such that the winning candidate for president will see his or her party gain House and Senate seats? Or will coattails be muted? So that's one question. And the second question is, if there is a landslide, right, will the Democrats win control of the House and the Senate? So I want to handle the coattails question, and we want to handle, are there offsets to coattails? And I, those are something we don't think about very much, but on which political scientists have done some very good work. So I'm going to be a little more academic and a little less talking head like this morning. Uh, but if you want your questions, we can get into the talking heads thing. If you want me to give exact predictions, certainly I'll give them. But I'll tell you that I'm very likely wrong. Uh, it's an admission up front. Uh, uh, political scientists are like economists. You would not go to an economist to learn what stocks to buy. Do not go to a political scientist to get accurate predictions on election outcomes necessarily. So let's start with the first question. No? Are there different factors in understanding House and Senate elections? Well, let's start with something very basic. Remember, I'm Lieutenant Colombo, and very often the most important clues are right there out in front of your nose and they get ignored. So let's pay attention to some things which are pretty obvious to begin with. First of all, we, only know, we know that only a third of the Senate seats are up, but all the House seats are up, actually 34 Senate seats. 435 House seats, you would think that the short-term forces affecting voters this year, things which are either working for the Democrats or working for the Republicans, things that are specific to this election year, would have a bigger effect on the House races than on the Senate races. But that's not the case. If you look at the data from one of the services that's trying to predict all the races, and Cook's political report's a good one to go to, Cook shows that 93% of the House races are either rated solid for one candidate or another, one party or another, or likely for one party or another. Right? 93% of them. So in his analysis, relatively few of them are in play. By comparison, in the Senate, only 74% are rated likely or solid. 26% of them are either toss-up races or leaning races. So there's greater play in the Senate than there is in the House, even though we're led to believe back from the founders that the House would be the more volatile institution and the Senate would be the more stable institution in terms of its membership. Yes. We're going to get to gerrymandering. You didn't get that, right? Somebody over here? What? Oh. Okay. That's all right. But just one more thing. Senate contests aren't random. The 34 Senate races this year are not a random selection of the entire U.S. Senate. The entire U.S. Senate is split when you add the two independents who organize with the Democrats in, 54 Republicans, 46 Democrats, right? Very closely, nearly a 50-50 split. This Senate class that is up in 2016 has 24 Republicans and only 10 Democrats, right? And, well, it moved without me having to do anything. Good. So, oops, if we look 
at this picture of the seats and where they are up, there are two things I would like you to observe. There are two questions in how did we get to a situation where we have Senate races where over two to one, two to one ratio, over two to one ratio are Republican seats as opposed to Democratic seats in a body which is evenly split. And there are two factors. One is not all states have the same Senate classes. When a state joins the union, it is assigned a class one, a class two, or a class three. They're assigned two senators from those three classes. And the effort is to make the Senate in balance so you don't have a class which has 50 senators and another class which has 10 senators. There is some ability to make it some non-random selection, but largely it follows the order in which a state joined the union. So this Senate, Senate class, and you look at where the seats are, you notice, for example, that there are no Senate races in West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, and Mississippi, as you look for, up, right? The selection of where there are Senate races has an effect. And if you look at the groupings, for example, you would see that a large number of the states which have Senate races this year compared to the ones which do not, tend to be heavily, more heavily Republican states. So part of what's going on is just the geography of the situation, right? By comparison, this is the group that will have Senate elections in 2018. You notice that uh, if you draw a thing from Minnesota over, right? Look at all those blue states, and they are largely Democratic states. Every state in the Northeast has a Senate race in 2018, except for New Hampshire, right? And look at how few Southern states have Senate races in 2018, by comparison. So part of the reason that this group is so heavily Republic, uh, Democratic and the current class is so heavily Republican, it's just geography and the mix of geography, right? With politics over time. Nobody knew that when the states joined the union, right? That you'd have that. And in case you want to look at it, uh, this is, that's what 2020 looks like, right? So, so the Republicans, and look, almost every southern state except Florida has a, Senate race in 2020, right? And that is an even more heavily Republican class, all right? So part of what we've got going on here is geography, right? Geography. And the mix of geography and politics. The second thing which we need to look at, let me go back to this. Here's our class up this year, and who holds them. The second thing we have to look at, one more thing, obviously, is um, when this class was last elected. It was elected in 2010, and therefore it's up in 2016. And those of you who have memories of this, remember that 2010 was a very good Republican year. So, in fact, unlike the House class, which is up this year, which was elected in 2014, this, which was a pretty good Republican, this class was elected in 2010, which was an excellent year for Republicans. So the other thing factoring in is these people were elected in a year which was a good election year from states which had a Republican tilt to them to begin with, and that's why you have such a heavily... Republican class up. The states aren't going to change. They haven't changed their partisanship very much in the last six years. Yes, there is some movement, but we still think of some states as heavily Republican, some states as battlegrounds, 
In some states, it's heavily Democratic states. They haven't changed. But the politics has changed. So one of the things that's going on is this is not as good a year for Republicans as 2010 was. Right? And that means that almost all the competitive seats that, oh, so if you're a Democratic senator, look at those red, the blue states up there, even the ones that are, the ones that are pale blue are, are ones where the incumbent has retired, or pale, the pink are where the incumbent has retired. If you were a Democrat and you survived 2010, they're probably not going to get you in 2016 unless something has happened to you. You survived a real bad election for your party. If you're a Republican, however, and you won in 2010, the winds of the election, the short-term winds, aren't going to be as favorable this year. So of the seats in play, of the 10 seats held by the Democrats, only one's in play. All the other seats that are in play are won by Republic, or, or held by Republicans. Right. Now that presents a great opportunity for the Democrats because the Republicans are badly exposed. And before you get too excited, if you are a Democrat, that this is the year we're going to really pick up seats because you've got, you know, six or seven vulnerable Republicans out there vulnerable Republican seats, maybe more, and only one vulnerable Democratic seat. This is, here's the other side of the coin if you're a Republican. If you survive this year, <laughs> if you don't lose too much of that 24-10 advantage, right, this class continues for the next six years. Another way of saying it is, if the Democrats don't win control of the Senate in this election, it may be very hard for them to win it for six years, for the next year, six years. Not impossible, but it becomes more difficult. So this is both an opportunity, but the real problem is you can have a missed opportunity. Right? Uh, Republicans in 2000, uh, 2012 had a missed opportunity. Right. The Democrats had a big class going in, and it, they came out with the, that sizable advantage, which helped them retain the majority until 2000, after 2014. But just one more thing. We're talking about differences between House and Senate races. Senate seats are more competitive than House seats in general. Why are they more competitive? In part, they are more competitive in partisan terms, because with some exceptions, they are more populous, more diverse constituencies than House members have. And the more populous, the more diverse it is, the more likely it is to be competitive. House districts, although they have 700,000 people, can be fairly homogeneous in their makeup. And that means they can be fairly homogeneous politically, and we'll talk more about that. So they're more competitive in partisan terms, meaning that's where the action is. So it's another reason that, another difference, another reason more, more Senate seats are in play. In addition, the seats are more valued. Why are they more valued? They're one of 100. Right? Not one of 435. And they're for six-year terms rather than two-year terms. So people who invest in politics are more likely to invest in Senate seats, which may, may be marginally competitive, than in House seats that are more, more marginally competitive. You got more payoff, more bang for the buck. The media is going to pay more attention to them because they're more important. So if you're a challenger in a house race, people may not know who you are. You may not have a hard time getting any traction because nobody pays attention to your race. But the media pays attention to Senate races. So they get coverage. And if you're a challenger, 
you've got a chance to go after the incumbent more easily. Because there are fewer Senate seats, it's more likely that the public is going to hold senators, incumbent senators, accountable for what happens in the country. House members can do a lot of district servicing. They can say, I'm only one of 435. I voted against that program, which you don't like. It's much easier for a House member to avoid accountability, and it's harder for a senator to avoid accountability. Finally, you know, there's a bigger pool of challengers, good challengers. One of the reasons that a lot of House members get reelected is something to do with the makeup of the districts, and I'll talk. But it's also because there may be a very small pool of potentially strong challengers to run against them. And if the potentially strong challengers don't run against them, they wind up running against the palooka of the week, right? <laughs> you know that term, right? Yeah. Uh, I, can't, I have to explain that to my undergraduates, too. <laughs> they wind up running against the palooka of the week. And what do they do? They knock the palooka of the week out, and they look stronger than ever. But if a good challenger, potential challenger, passes on a Senate race, there may be someone else in that larger constituency who is a viable politician who's run for office before, who knows how to raise money, and can be a good challenger. So that also adds into the differential competitiveness, the bigger pool of challengers. But just one more thing. We know that House members are supposed to have greater incumbency advantage. Doesn't that work into this? Yes, it does. We rarely talk about incumbency advantage when we discuss Senate elections, but we talk about it all the time when we discuss House elections. The rates at which House incumbents win re-election has been at 90% or above and during the 1970s and 80s, sometimes in 90s, sometimes reached up to about 97 or 98 percent. And the margin of victory, the average margin of victory of these House incumbents went up in the 1970s and 80s and has remained at a very high level. They're not just winning, they're one, winning by bigger margins in the last 30 to 40 years. There are around 390 House incumbents running for re-election in the general election, five lost in primaries. And even if the Democrats win control of the House of Representatives by winning a net excess of 30 seats from the Republicans, more than 90% of incumbents are going to get re-elected. So we have high re-election rates and margin of victories have been high since the 1970s and they've stayed at those historic levels. But just one more thing. This is not all about incumbency advantage and the mistake is to say it's about incumbency. Political scientists, we're a pretty clever group sometimes. Not too often, but, you know, we like to, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the monkeys that you put the piano and we will eventually compose Beethoven symphonies if we're there long <laughs> enough. High re-election rates and high margins of victory aren't necessarily linked to incumbency. Incumbency may be only one part of it. In fact, the way we measure incumbency, and I don't want to go to details because it will be almost as deadly as talking about campaign finance. I don't want to talk about it. You know, you'll, you'll glaze over immediately. Just take my word for it. The way we measure incumbency advantage has shown that over the last 20 years, incumbency advantage has declined. And to think of incumbency advantage, it is the ability of incumbents to exceed the percentage of vote that you would expect given 
the district they run from, to do better than a non-incumbent would do running in that seat, right? That differential has gone down. But the rates of re-election and the margins of victory have remained the same. And the reason is there's not just incumbency advantage, there's also something called partisan advantage. And what has happened is partisan advantage has increased. That is, if we look at those House districts and we look at the average partisan difference between how many Republicans live in that district and how many Democrats live in that district. That's been going up. That's been going up. Right? And so members do not have to earn incumbency advantage. Do all the, a lot of them do all the things they used to do. Service the district, go home a lot, modify their roll call votes, to appeal to independents and opposite party partisans, the Republican who's trying to pick up extra Democratic votes, or the Democratic congressman who's trying to pick up extra Republican votes to ensure re-election in a competitive district. If the district's not competitive, you don't have to do as much of that. Right? Why, if you're getting 65% of the vote and you know you can get that safely, why would you work hard to get 70% of the vote? You can do other things with your time and resources. On the other hand, if you're getting 52% of the vote, you better bust your butt. Otherwise, you know, you get a partisan swing of an election that's three or four points the other way, and you're out of office. So as we've increased the number of seats which are overwhelmingly safe in partisan terms, fewer members need to work for incumbency advantage. Well, just one more thing. You know, we have another question, and, and we want to tie up these loose ends. Why is it that partisan advantage has increased? Yes? My question is, how about the fact that the term of a House member is two years, and he is spending so much time on elections and getting reelected? Yes, they do spend a lot of time, even if, you know, even if you have safe seat, but they don't have to spend as much if you have a safe district. And if you don't have good challengers, you know, if you're in a 53% district, boy, you better spend time. But if you're in a 70% district, less concerned with doing it. So it's, it's, yes, you're right. They always, in fact, they're always running for re-election. But the amount of time you have to do of that in a close district is different than in a very safe district. So why have we seen this increase in partisan safety? Something we don't worry about mostly in Senate races, but certainly in House races. There are usually two explanations that are offered. One is gerrymandering, gerrymandering and redistricting. That when redistricting occurs, it occurs in partisan terms. And there is a big incentive for whatever party is in control to make districts as safe as they can. In fact, if you're in a state where the Republicans control the redistricting, what they want to do is make all the Republican House members as fairly safe, but they want to make the Democratic seats overwhelmingly safe. So they pack as many Democrats as they can into those districts, right? This is the argument. And they make the Republican district 60 to 65 percent. They make the Democratic district 75 percent. Minimize the number of districts you have to give to the other party. Make your own district safe. And you do that by packing, as, you know, drawing the district lines to shove every voter you can from the other party. I mean, that's the argument, right? I'll come back to it in a second. The second one is the creation of majority-minority districts, which is another form of packing. You packed African Americans and Latinos in heavy amounts into districts to ensure the election of a minority member, removing them, and they're largely Democratic voters, removing them from surrounding districts, making those districts more safe for Republicans, and making the majority-minority district overwhelmingly Democratic. Those are the two explanations that are out there. 
but I don't like them. <laughs> I think they're at best overstated and at worst wrong. So I took something and I said, what's been going on in house districts where there's no redistricting occurring? Right? If, in fact, this partisan safety has been going up, we shouldn't find any change. If it's due to gerrymandering or the creation of minor majority minority districts, we shouldn't find it in places where there is no redistricting going on. And we conveniently have seven states which only have a single congressional district. So they never have to redistrict unless they get an extra seat, right? But the seven have been. And just to refresh you, that's Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Vermont, Delaware, Alaska, and Montana. All have one congressional district. So I created this hypothetical state made up of those seven states and said, it's a state with seven districts which never redistrict. Right? And I asked, looking at the competitiveness of the vote in presidential elections in, those, in that state, I wish I could give the state a clever name, compared to the other states where they do do redistricting. And guess what? In the states where there's been redistricting, there has been a decline in partisan competitiveness of the congressional districts as they vote in presidential elections. It's underlined. It's declined and declined markedly over the last 20 to 30 years. But guess what? In my hypothetical state, where there's been absolutely no redistricting, it's declined just as much, if not slightly more. Hmm. Oh, 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 this, they're a mix, they're a mix. Okay. Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Vermont, Vermont, Delaware, Alaska, Montana. Okay? They're a mix. They all have one congressional district. It doesn't matter, because I'm looking at, it doesn't matter which presidential candidate is carrying them by how much it's the, you know, it's the absolute value of the different, you know, how com competitive they are. Second one, uh, majority-minority districts. So I took the states which have created majority and minority districts, and I said, oh, that's where partisan competitiveness will have declined. And I looked at the states which didn't, didn't have create majority-minority districts. No difference. Partisan competitiveness has declined in both by about the same amount. Hmm. Are you measuring that again by the margin? Yeah, margin, margins. Some underlying measure of partisanship, but it's a use, usually used presidential vote in the district. So the question is, what's going on here? And uh, I argued it has something to do with the fact that we're really easy to gerrymander. And we're really easy to gerrymander, and some people have picked up on this idea and written more popular points, which they call it the big sort. But it's a very simple idea, and it is increasingly Democrats are moving closer to Democrats and Republicans are moving closer to Republicans. It would be like having a checkerboard where Democrats and Republicans are the black squares and the red squares, and they're in competitive areas because they're, you're living next to people of the opposite party. And you moved all the black squares to one side of the board and all the red squares to the other side of the board. And it's easy to gerrymander you then. Now, why is this occurring? One, if I asked my undergraduates, where are you going after you graduate? They... Uh, and some of them say, I'm going to San Francisco, Chicago, New York, Boston. And others say, I'm going to Phoenix, Dallas, or Atlanta. And you ask them their partisan identification, there's a real difference. Or, if we look at people in your demographic, 
and we ask, where are you going when you retire? If you're, if you're, well, there are stayers, and they're different than the movers. That is, people who move. And we ask, who's going to the west coast of Florida versus who's going to the east coast of Florida? And who's going to Scottsdale versus who's going to Madison, Wisconsin, and live outside a university city? Uh, they're different politically. And if we ask people when they get somewhere, are you going to move when you move to Nashville? Are you going to live in the city of Nashville set proper? Are you going to live in the first tier of suburbs? Or are you going to live in the second tier of suburbs? Real estate agents play a part in this inadvertently. Because they try to figure out who you are and where you want to live. And it's on bases that are not what are your politics, but they're on bases that are correlated with partisanship. And because of the automobile and highways, we, can, we have more choices to do this. And increasingly, we find that people are moving closer to other people for obvious reasons, but those reasons tend to be related to partisanship now. And so we start putting ourselves in situations where it's easy to put us into heavily Democratic and heavily Republican districts. We make it easy to do so. So, I sh should have given you this slide. I didn't. Okay. Got incumbency advantage, but that's the answer. That's why we have congressional districts which are not party competitive. Pogo said it best for those of you who remember Pogo. We have met the enemy, and he is us. We're doing it to ourselves. So if you're a Republican, I tell you to go live near Democrats. And if you're a Democrat, I tell you to go live near Republicans. And we can solve this problem pretty easily. <laughs> but it's probably not going to happen. So if the story of the Senate is to watch the partisan swing of a given year and the states having Senate races, the story of the House is that members less frequently rely on incumbency advantage whether something's an open seat or an incumbent running is less important. And more important to understand the importance of underlying partisanship and partisan swing. But just one more thing before we leave this. House candidates are now relying less on incumbency advantage and more on the partisan makeup of their districts. So if they do have trouble, they have less insulation than they once had. They don't have constituents who say, well, I know the winds are blowing the other way, but I like my incumbent and I'm going to vote for the incumbent because they're not building their basis on so I think in some ways they create a vulnerability when the partisan winds are very strong. The question is, this year is, are those partisan winds very strong? Is partisan swing big enough that you're likely to have high turnover? Okay, mystery one, I don't want to say solved, but unpacked. Part underlying partisanship, yes, sort of the makeup, the partisan makeup of a given congressional district, right? So what percentage of the people in the district are Democrats versus what percentage of the people in the district are Republicans? That would be an easy way. And the, the, the short, the, the rule of thumb we used is look at the average presidential vote in the district and compare it to the national presidential vote. So if the national presidential vote's 52-48, but that district voted 72 to uh, 38 to 28. You get a sense of the difference, right? Would that be enough, regardless of whether they're conservative or liberal? Uh, increasingly, that doesn't make a lot of difference. No. Conservative Republic, uh, conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, long ago fell off the endangered species list and went on to the extinct list, right? <laughs> Thank you.
moderates of both parties are now on the endangered list. Right? So how good are various indicators at predicting the outcomes of these House and Senate elections? Lots of House elections are easy to predict. You know, Charlie Cook isn't going to be wrong on many of those races when he says, you know, 390 of them or so are solid or, you know, I, you know, I can predict those too. You know, just, you know, not even being fully awake, I can predict a bunch of those races. You know, you're in Tennessee. There are nine house races up in Tennessee, right? None of them is close. None of them is competitive. Right? There's one open seat. It's not competitive. Right? You can predict there'll be seven Republicans and two Democrats, just like there are right now after this election. Right? So, uh, but predicting the others, predicting the competitive ones is more difficult, especially those in the lean or toss-up categories. And why is that difficult? One, we don't have good polling data on House districts. Some candidates will poll, but doing polling is expensive. Sometimes party organizations will poll on behalf of a candidate. But the polling is either bad or non-existent, and I don't know which is worse. Voters know less about these candidates, and they learn about them later than about presidential candidates. So that means voters knowing less are more likely to be more volatile in voting in competitive House races than there are in competitive pres uh, presidential races. It's like, you know, you go to vote in a pre competitive presidential race, and it's like two restaurants that you've been to a hundred times, and you know everything about the menu, and if you get a bad meal in one, you don't necessarily stop going there. In the House, though, one or both of the candidates are the restaurants you haven't gone to very often, and if you get in new information, you get a bad meal or you get a good meal, it's likely to change your point of view. Because people don't know as much. So that makes them harder to predict, right? They're, so they're more volatile. Well, so polling isn't very useful because we know that's going to be pretty volatile in these close races, and the polling's not very good. Sometimes um, we're not bad at predicting the aggregates. Oh, the other thing is, <laughs> in House races, candidate skills and resources vary a lot. Presidential races, they're both sides in World War I. There are differential abilities, and you can't always pick those out in close races, right? Political scientists have developed models to predict the aggregate. You know, you get this thing called the generic House vote. You wonder, you know, what is that? Is that something you get at the drugstore, a generic house vote? You know, and it's a not very good question which gets asked, if the election were held today, would you vote for the Democratic candidate for Congress or the Republican candidate for Congress? That assumes the people asking know who the Democratic and Republican candidate, because I can't ask them about. And you aggregate that, and you get a percentage 53% say they're going to vote for the Democratic candidate, and 47% say they're going to vote for the Republican. And then you extrapolate that to seats, which is dicey to do. Let me just put it that way. But we know that's also very volatile, right? Because sometimes people do not know who the Democrat, and they go in, they, oh, that's the Democratic candidate, or that's the Republican candidate. It's not like Trump and Clinton, where you know who is Democratic and who is the Republican candidate. And we notice that that goes up and down quite a bit. So one thing is after all the recent Trump escapades, or alleged escapades, whatever you want to define it, you know, they started asking a generic House question, and the margins were wider. So there's concern about, among Republicans. The seat-to-seat -seat stuff doesn't show that up yet, but we, you know, who knows? Uh, some predictions are based on presidential approval rating. The higher the president's approval rating, the better his House candidates run, even if the president's not running for re-election. Right? So we know, pres we know state of the economy helps the House candidates of the incumbent party, right? the party of the president. A bad economy hurts them. Right? 
well, the economy it depends what indicators you use. If you use GDP, it's not so great. If you use leading economic indicators, this is getting inside baseball stuff of political scientists. You get a more favorable prediction for the Democrats. I like to use something called an exposure model. Over the long term in a given era, each party ought to win so many seats. You know, if nothing is going on, maybe the Republicans right now in this era should win about 225 to 230 seats, and the Democrats should win 205 to 210. The Republicans are above that. That means they're overexposed in the House. If you're overexposed, that means you're winning seats which are more marginal. And it means the other party, which is underexposed, is knocked down to its hard core of seats. Hard to win those seats because you haven't won them previously. So right now, the Republicans have a fairly large number of seats. They're overexposed. The Democrats are knocked down in the House to a lot of safe seats, people who survived 2010 and 2014. So my expectation is the Republicans ought to lose seats and the Democrats ought to gain seats, and we could predict exactly how many that's supposed to be. Yeah. So that fits. Is it enough for the Democrats to win control? Good question. Most of the models are saying the Democrats will pick up somewhere from the low teens to the upper 20s. Charlie Cook is sort of cutting that back down because he does individual seats and tries to find these individual seats that are likely to change. Most of the toss-up seats are seats now held by Republicans. So the Democrats ought to gain seats. But we're not very exact on this. I feel much more confident of telling you who's going to win the presidency than I do in giving you, you know, giving you, you know, the pickup seats. Yes, some models would push it up toward 30 seats. In the Senate, polling again is not as reliable. Races are more volatile than presidential races. Again, people are finding things out about candidates. The level of exposure is again meaningful. The Republicans, you know, have a lot of seats because this is the class that came out of 2010, so you expect them to lose seats. If the Democrats were in control and you had a Democratic president, if there were 24 Democratic seats and 10 Republican seats, again, the president's job approval rating would factor in, the state of the economy would factor in. No? So Obama having a fairly high level of popularity is good for Democratic Senate candidates, especially when the Democrats control the Senate or have a lot of seats, but they don't have many seats up and these people probably aren't, for the most part, endangered anyway. The one that's endangered is in Harry Reid's seat in Nevada, and Harry's not running. Well, that's not very, very satisfying. But just one more thing. The best guess is that these seven or eight or nine close Senate seats, and this I can give you, will not split evenly. The best guess is that the eight seats are not going to split 4-4. Right. And rarely do they. So if your prediction is the Democrats are likely to gain three or four seats and you know, they may not get the majority in the Senate if they change, my sense is it's more likely that one party is going to win six of them and the other party is going to win two than it's going to be a 4-4 split. And the reason for this is, and this is, happens all the time, you know, in 2014, the close Senate seats didn't split evenly. 2012, 2010, you can go back. They don't split evenly. And the reason is because whatever partisan forces are operating as you get close to the election, don't help a Democrat in one state and hurt a Democrat in another state, right? They tend to have, there's sort of a national swing going on of some sort. It's usually having a national effect, not a particularized effect, and it's moving those close races one way or another. Does that make more sense to you? So you don't get an even split. It usually is what 
pushes, what's pushing things at the end moves them one way or another. And, you know, you can find real upsets given poll results in Senate elections because the polling isn't as good. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if you told me the Democrats won six of the eight seats, I'd say, yeah, that makes sense, or that the Republicans won six or more. Yes, could happen. Now watch this year, it'll be four, four. Remember I said, <laughs> remember I said early on, I've been wrong. I've been wrong. Well, now we get down to what you're really interested in. The first two thirds you didn't care a darn about, but I had to do it because I want to interest you in congressional elections. And you want to know, you know, what, what's the effect of the presidential election? All right, so I'm going to try to sum this up in a few minutes so we can get your, your question. Will there be presidential coattails? Will Hillary have coattails? How long will they be? You know, will they be enough to put the Democrats in control of the Senate and maybe in control of the House as well? Well, first, I don't like the use of presidential coattails. Whatever they are, they may be presidential coattails, but they're usually short-term forces that are affecting the presidential race and those same short-term forces of the election. Maybe the issues, maybe the state of the economy, maybe the attractiveness of the top of the ticket, yes, are affecting the other races as well. And that people who are going to vote for Hillary for president are more likely to vote for Democrats for Congress, and people who vote for Trump for president are more likely to vote for Republicans for Congress. And the heavily they, more heavily the vote is for one candidate, the more heavily is it, it is for their candidates for Congress but it may not be because of the presidential candidate. And we see, obviously, in this year, as we did in 1996, that the, the party that doesn't think it's going to win the presidential election, their congressional candidates start to say, uh, you don't want the other party controlling the full government. Vote for us for House and Senate races. They throw the presidential candidate under the bus. And to add to this sense that presidential coattails may be meaningful, we've seen over the last 20 years a decline in split ticket voting. Our electorate is more polarized in partisan terms, in terms of supporting, than it, than it had been in the 1970s and 1980s, where there was a lot more split ticket voting. So there may be reason that their presidential, expect the presidential vote and the congressional vote to be more voters to couple those two, right, and rather than to split them. So in 1972, George McGovern got wiped out 60-40 in the presidential election, and Democrats retained control of the House and Senate. That's not, if you had a 60-40 this year, that probably wouldn't happen, right? So you have this potential coattail effect, or whatever you want to call it, but then you have the sense that there is some preference in the American public for divided party control. And there are some political scientists who argue that there are actually people who go out there and try to vote for divided party control. They do not want one party controlling the presidency, the House, and the Senate. They think we are better off if you, that either party is more extreme than they would like and they, they want to produce balance. It's a lovely theory. Just when we try to go out and find these people, we can't find them. <laughs> Political scientists are great, great at theories, and the theories we just don't always have the data to find that these, there are people who are actually doing that. I have a good friend, Bob Erickson, who was a colleague of mine in Houston and now teaches at Columbia, who argues uh, something different. And he argues that there is a balancing that voters do if they have good information that one party is going to win the presidency, it is clear. Then they have the opportunity to offset or balance that at the time of elections. Otherwise, they have to wait two years to do it. And that means that the landslide elections we've seen over recent decades where you have better polling information mean that people have an opportunity to balance because they have a better idea of who's going to win the presidency. 
The one time this didn't work in the last 30 years is 1980, where everybody thought right up to the end that it was neck and neck between Carter and Ronald Reagan. And in fact, Reagan wins with a landslide, but you don't have the chance to balance. And so the Republicans win control of the Senate and pick up lots of House seats, right? Bob has now sort of tried to find out how big is this balancing effect. And he's, again, a model you don't want to look at. But he has shown that there is a coattail effect, or whatever you want to call it, that is offset by a balancing effect, but the coattail effect is larger. The coattail effect is larger. As a matter of fact, in case, if you don't put the balancing effect in, it makes coattails look smaller than coattails are. So he said, a coattail or that effect is, that short-term effect is big, but people are balancing. I love it. He's got good data to show it. Again, not all voters can do it. So if you are in Tennessee, you don't have any chance at balancing, right? All those House seats are safe, and we know which candidate's going to win the presidency in this state, most likely, right? No, you're not going to have. So you have to be somewhere where you can balance, which means in these, probably in these close Senate races. And maybe in some close House races, harder to do, fewer of them. So that's why you're likely to see if Hillary should win big, the Democrats win control of the Senate. But she has to win bigger for them to win control of the House. Right? And there may be, again, some balancing effect to, that will limit that. That will limit that. So if she wins, you know, the presidency by three or four points, maybe the Democrats won't win control of the Senate. No. She may have to win it by more. But it's an interesting idea that we do have, just that, you know, it's hard to find voters who can do it. We might want to do it, we just can't do it. No. So these are... Um, these are a few ideas. Uh, they are, you know, there's always just one more thing when you want to talk about this stuff. This is what keeps me in business. There's always a new mystery to solve. You know? And I find these congressional elections much harder to deal with, much more interesting. Maybe it's not as important as who gets to be president, whether who controls the House and the Senate. But we're in a very interesting partisan era. The control of Congress will make a difference in terms of what items even get on the policy agenda. The range of things a new president will be able to do legislatively. The amount of gridlock we may have. And who will be future presidential candidates. Because after all, as we look at this, a lot of our potential presidential candidates come from these ranks, and winning and losing a Senate campaign can be critical to where your career goes. But I think they're just fun on their own. And hopefully, you know, you'll turn on C-SPAN and watch a Senate debate in New Hampshire or Arizona or Alaska and find out that some of those actually are interesting and actually discuss about, talk about public policy. rather than tuning on whatever is on. Oh, it's the uh, baseball playoffs tonight. Uh, <laughs> so maybe I should stop there and take off the raincoat and throw away my cigar and uh, answer questions that you might have. Yes, sir. Right. Um, the question, the question is, this question: If you are a conservative 
Republican or a very li a liberal Democrat, is there somebody, if you're a Democrat, who runs at you in a primary from your left or a Republican from your right in a lot of these safe districts? In a lot of these safe districts, you're more worried about the primary election than you are at the general election. In fact, as I noted, only five incumbents were defeated in primaries. At least one of those was a Republican in Kansas who was a Tea Partier who was defeated by somebody who was not as extreme as he was. So it can work both ways. Uh, at least one or two of them involved people who were involved in corruption. So on the one hand, I think this fear of being primary is overstated. On the other hand, if you're a member of the House particularly, or the Senate, you worry about it. It's sort of like we all know, we, we know getting on an airplane is terribly safe, wonderfully safe way to travel. But somebody knows about an airplane crash. And for an incumbent member of Congress, you're always worried about the airplane crash. You know the guy or the gal who thought they were safe, and somebody ran against them in a primary and beat them. So you overprotect against those things. But it's clearly overstated. There aren't that many people who really have to worry about it. You just don't know where you are. It's sort of a random event, but you don't want that to, to take place. Yes, please. Yes, off-year elections have lower turnout. By the way, all this talk about turnout in the presidential election, it's going to be high. Turnout matters. This is, this is an irony. Turnout matters when turnout is low, because then candidates can get a differential advantage from turnout. So turnout matters more in midterm elections when turnout is low, where one party can get a differential, than in presidential elections when turnout is relatively high. It's hard to get an advantage on the other side, right? So, yes, and we know certain types of voters tend to drop out of the electorate at midterms, and that's when enthusiasm differences don't make much difference in the general election. They make a lot of difference in midterm elections. Yeah. So, yes, uh, if you really want to know where it makes the most difference turnout, open seat primaries for the House and Senate. If you were in New York and you voted in one of the primaries in New York, an open seat on Long Island, uh, the winners of the Democratic and Republican primaries each got about 10 to 15,000 votes. Democrats likely to win the seat, but effectively won the seat by being able to mobilize 10 to 15,000 people in a primary election. That's when money makes a difference. That's when participation makes a difference. Right? and fewer people vote in primary elections. And those are very often tantamount to who wins the seat. Yes, sir. Uh, on some things, yes, on other things, no. So it tends to be a way to jawbone, to mobilize your base, to make those sorts of arguments. You may carry through on some of that, you may not. There are some things which will get done. It would be less than if you had a less polarized Congress than you have. You know, if the electorate's polarized, the members of Congress are more polarized, right? So I think it is difficult for whoever is president, and it is one of the reasons why presidents are doing things by avoiding Congress and why the public is tolerating it, because they're willing to let the executive have more power. So if you ask me, my real concern is not necessarily, I think the concern you expressed is very, a very real one, 
but some stuff does get done despite what goes on because there are reasons that you, you want to keep things going. But I think the real concern, if I were, is um, we keep adding power to the executive branch. You know, if Congress is dysfunctional, and as a, someone who studies Congress, I get very concerned about that. You know, it becomes the, the people are more willing to, to tolerate it. You know, people are more, let me get over there. Yes, sir. There was an effort, obviously, in the early 1990s to push for term limits. Many states did that in state legislatures. They tried to do it for the congressional seats, but that violated the US Constitution, so they could do it. The results from the state legislatures are that it has not made elections any more competitive. If anything, in term limited seats, term limits, it's reduced competitiveness because people don't challenge incumbents who are only going to serve one more term as much. So it's actually reduced competitiveness. My problem with term limits is um, it keeps the bad members in longer and gets the good members out sooner. <laughs> you know, uh, despite what we think, the American people, the really bad members, they tend to, you know, they tend to lose elections. You know? And the problem is with term limits is you'd like to keep the good people and get rid of the bad people. Well, you can't keep the good people because they're term limited out. I don't think it would pass, even when you tried to get the constitutional amendment through the 104th Congress with those new Gingrich majorities, it was one part of the contract with America that did not even pass the House of Representatives. Right? So the first thing you have to do is, before you get a constitutional amendment up for ratification, you've got to get you know, the House and the Senate to, by two-thirds votes, to put the amendment out to the state legislatures. I don't think that's likely to happen. So even whether we like it or not, I suspect we're not going to get it. The better thing is to go out and, you know, try to make elections more competitive. So. Yes? Well, this is a question of whether we should get rid of the, the Electoral College. Now, we should say, and this people, a, a couple of things. Uh, yes, people ought to vote despite the Electoral College and despite the fact that one candidate went, for a number of reasons. One, you know, obviously you might feel good about voting, which a lot of people do, and they see it as citizen duty, but I would say that, you know, we tend to think about liberties and rights in America and being deprived of those liberties and rights. And we don't think about being a citizen and not carrying responsibilities. And so I like to talk to my classes, and I can talk to this group as well, and say, you know, we have some responsibilities as citizens. And one of them is, boy, everybody in places where they can't vote would love to be able to vote, whether an election is competitive or not. But it's probably a minimal responsibility that you have as a citizen. This is not just a free ride. And I think if we treat it as a free ride, that's problematic, because then things are controlled by the people who don't treat it as a free ride. And um, one other thing, I'll get off my soapbox in a second. Uh, one other thing is that all my students think that politics ends after the election. And my sense is part of the problem is they don't recognize that this is the beginning of the political process. The election is the start of the political process, not the end of the political process. And too many of us take the responsibilities as citizenship too limited, and we think we voted, we've served on jury duty if we haven't ducked it, and uh, that's all we have to do. So my sense is we have to start talking to people about citizenship responsibilities a little more. Now, 
there are ways states can change their electoral, uh, uh, electoral college voting if they want to, without getting rid of the electoral college. So there are some states, uh, Maine and Nebraska, where you get an electoral college vote for carrying a given congressional district. States could, if they wanted to, vote so the electoral college in their state would go proportionately to the, uh, the vote in the state. States have ability to change this. Now, often there are people who propose this, so Republicans in California have said, let's in California go to proportional vote for the electoral college, you know, because they know they're not going to win California and it's, it's uh, 55 electoral votes, right? So some states would not want to do that because, you know, for obvious reasons. But there are ways in which states are free to change the way their electors are selected. One of the problems with getting rid of the Electoral College is, and this is not a defense of it in some ways, but let's assume we were back in 2000 and we didn't have an Electoral College, and we had the result, which was Al Gore winning by 500,000 votes, and you say, uh, wow, yeah, we would have gotten the popular vote winner instead of George W. Bush, who won the Electoral College vote. But I'll tell you, if a presidential election in this country was decided by 500,000 votes, we would wind up with a national recount, right? Because when you add things up, it's certainly possible over the huge number of votes cast, it means that elections like 1960 and 2000 would have wound up with national recounts. So we have to be careful about what we want to ask for and what we want to substitute because it may have consequences we don't like. But yes, if you ask, would I prefer a national popular vote? Sure. It fits with a small d idea of what democracy is about. Maine has it, so one congre there are four, con four uh, electoral votes in Maine. And they have it so the winner of each congressional district gets an elector, and the winner of the state gets the other two. So it is possible to have split electors. In 2012, Obama won one of the um, five electoral votes in Nebraska, for example. So they do split where it's carried by congressional districts. Yes? Do you believe that the I think it would be um, very strange, even though most times a Republican candidate would win. You might have people who felt that they had to vote for the candidate who carried their state. You might have all sorts of things going on. Uh, I don't think it's likely to happen this year. In uh, 1980, I know that a member of the House of Rules Committee had a staff member working on a report. This is when John Anderson was running and it looked like he would get 20% of the vote at one point. On how would the House proceed if, in fact, that occurred, that nobody got a majority of electoral votes. So, you know, we haven't done that since 1824. Um, people don't even know how we'd proceed if that happened. And the huge unpopularity of both candidates, over 90% of Democrats, people identify, say they're voting for Hillary, and depends on Republicans, but still probably just under 90% of the Republicans still say they're going to vote for Trump. So that makes it very unlikely that even though these candidates seemingly are unpopular, they're largely mostly unpopular with voters in the other party, although some are dissatisfied. <laughs> And I always ask people who don't like the candidates, I say, well, who would you have preferred was running? You know, who would you want instead? Was that candidate viable? Did that candidate enter? You know? So sometimes we're caught by that. Yes? Thank you.